we can kind of dive into the meat of the topic as it is. And this is probably, in my opinion, one of the most important things that Dr. Vincelli said in his presentation on Friday. And this kind of gives away my perspective on genetically modified organisms. I'm going to try to stay as neutral as possible because, of course, the point of you getting this education is to become, if you're not already, self, well, informed, yes, but self-informing. So you should be able to, the goal of the university education, especially in biology, is to be able to go out and access information. That's why, by the way, part of the reason we use these in class, to go out and collect information, assess whether or not it's valid information, and then make a decision for yourself. So I'm here to point out some, some vagaries and some things you might not have thought about regarding genetically modified organisms. So Dr. Mincelli said it's not important how genetic changes occur, that is, from the genetic modification point of view, whether or not a scientist engineers a mutation, or if a mutation happens at random like they normally do during growth out in nature, what really matters is what the mutation does. That was his perspective. One of the first things we're going to work on is figuring out a, a definition for a genetically modified organism. Those slides aren't posted. Hmm. It's another one of those days where I swear I thought I did, but apparently I did not. Okay, so in two minutes, there's going to be a little activity for you, and I will post the slides then. We've got, I think, one or two slides before we get there. And this is not anything you necessarily need to take notes on. This is something I found in a local flyer for one of our grocery stores in the region. Some of you might recognize the pros and know which grocery store it is, but I'm not going to give it away. Let's see. They can go from ripe to OMG. OMG, by the way, is not GMO. Well, it is GMO backwards, but that has nothing to do with why I posted this. Why did I post this? Is there, I, there's, a, there's a contradict to me. There's a contradiction in here. They talk about crossbreeding, hybridizing, and then they say not genetically modified. Right. That's my opinion, that crossbreeding is a form of genetic modification. You take two parents with two different sets of DNA. You make an offspring that combines traits from the two parents. You should certainly, on your own, decide if you think that's genetic modification or not. But this is to highlight the reason for needing to come up with some sort of a working definition for what a genetically modified organism is. Okay, so what we're in class to do today is first to come up with this definition, and then I'll go through some examples and we'll have some discussion about techniques for genetically modified organisms. Just some pretty pictures of genetically modified organisms. Which one is genetically modified, do you think? That tomato up there? Yeah. That tomato up there? Which one? The big one or the little one? The red one. <laughs> what, about the, what about the salmon? All of them but the human. All of them but the human. The human. The shirt. And the shirt. The, who knows? The shirt might be made out of genetically modified cotton. Spray on shirt. So all of these are examples. So that is a great question. How do you know which of those is genetically modified? And we're going to get to that question by the end of class today. OK, so here is where I'm going to stop, let you work. I will upload the lecture PDFs. So get in a small group. You can work by yourself if you want, but it's more fun to work with partners, maybe. Take maximum of five minutes, come up with one sentence definition or one or two sentences at most. What does it mean to be a genetically modified organism? And then go to which, a website we haven't used in a while, david.com slash rossgenetics. Have one member from your group post your definition there by the end of five minutes. So 11.10. So we're going to take a look. Go ahead.
All right. Thank you very much for participating. We've got a flood of definitions coming in up here. So let's see if we can find some common themes. Let's see. Any sort of gene modification, whether it be natural or synthetic. I've scrolled through, and please feel free. You've got the power at your fingertips. Scroll through and see what common features you see in all of these definitions that are coming in. We've got organism with genetic material that has been altered using genetic engineering techniques. What counts as a genetic engineering technique? Sex. <laughs> it's, it's legitimate to me, opinion. Would CRISPR or CRISPR? CRISPR. Would that count? That would count. So CRISPR is a genetic engineering technique. That's one that Dr. Vincelli mentioned very briefly on Friday, which is where we can insert enzymes into organisms that will make specific small mutations, so directed mutations. What was the technique that was used before that to make mutations? Gene gun. It really is true. He mentioned this really briefly, but it really is true. I've done this to make transgenic worms as well. It doesn't just work on plants. You literally, you have a DNA you want to insert into an organism. You coat gold particles. You take gold dust, literally gold, I don't know why gold, but you buy gold powder, you coat it with DNA, you put it into a gun, and you literally shoot the gold particles into the tissue. Would it be like, does this gun still work like conventional like gunpowder kind of thing? It's a, it's, an, it's, a, it's a nitrogen pressure. Okay. 
So it uses a compressed gas to shoot. Because a while back I was talking with uh, with Dr. Burke from chemistry, and he did mention the thing of a gun, and I asked him, is DNA strong enough to survive the muzzle? So. <laughs> Yeah, so no, t do, no temperature change. It's just the gold is a method to, it's, it's heavy enough to get the DNA through cell walls into the cell. And then if the cell happens to take up some of the DNA that's stuck on the gold particle and integrate it into its genome, then you get a transformed or a transgenic organism. I don't know who came up with this. Genius or crazy. Right? Or the, the line Or bored. <laughs> <laughs> Or drunk. Hey, look what I can do. <laughs> All right. Any sort of gene modification, whether it be natural or synthetic. Insertion of a gene that was not in the P0 generation. So what happens if you, let's see. Ah, so... Not naturally occurring is something I saw pop up at least a few times in these different definitions. Change that's not naturally occurring. Let's focus on that for a minute. How do you define a naturally occurring piece of DNA, sequence of DNA? Any, anything where humans are not involved. So environment can change, so, so we've just been talking about control of gene expression, transcription in prokaryotes, transcription in eukaryotes, and we've seen, although not very much yet, that changes in the environment can affect how our genes get turned on and turned off, epigenetics. So we've already got external influences that play with whether or not genes get turned on or turned off, or how much of a gene gets turned into a protein. So not naturally occurring. Now, I, it doesn't matter to me which group wrote this, although if you want to have a, a debate, I'd be happy to. Brief. Oh, Alexis. Thanks. Good. So let's have a debate. Don't have to. Is this a sequence that never existed before or never could exist naturally? It's kind of a gray area, but I hope you, I hope you see where I'm going. That we've been on this planet for hundreds of thousands. We organisms have been on the planet for hundreds of thousands of years, and our DNA has been changing the whole time. Not only the lineage leading to humans, but the lineage leading to bacteria and plants, right? So there have been lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of DNA sequences on the planet in the time that living, that life has been on the planet. So how do you define what's a non-naturally occurring DNA sequence? Okay. When really there's no difference in the end product. Right. So this gets, sort of gets back to that original quote. It doesn't matter what the genetic mutation is. The reason that a lot of scientists and breeders like to use genetic modification is because it's faster, not because it produces something that's different than you could get by nature. It's just that instead of waiting around the... Um, sorry, I'll get to your question in just a minute. I didn't bring up to review at the start of class all of our questions from Socrative last class. But one of the questions I asked was, I apparently didn't phrase it very well. The answers were not what I was expecting, which is fine. I asked, where did the mutation originate that led to lactose tolerance into adulthood? And a lot of the answers were those two hypotheses. Was the, right. What I was hoping you were going to say was, what I meant was, where did lactose tolerance come from? There's a single mutation in the MCM gene in that intron over here that's in the gene upstream of lactose, lactase, lactose tolerance gene down there. Where did this mutation over here come from? How did that mutation occur? What caused it? Chance. Human selection for it? Yeah, a, a selection for it, but selection happens after the mutation occurs. How did that mutation occur? 
What made that first human lactose tolerant into adulthood? That's a mutation, a random mutation. How do random mutations happen? We've talked about this briefly in class. Could be UV exposure. Could be our cellular enzymes that correct UV exposure, thymine dimers, for example, introduce random mutations. Our DNA polymerases that copy our DNA aren't perfect. They make random changes. They're pretty close to perfect. But every once in a while, they accidentally incorporate the wrong nucleotide. So that very, 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 very first human that had that mutation, that was chance. That was just a random mutation that happened to be beneficial for that individual, if that individual happened to be consuming milk as an adult. So that's naturally occurring, I think. Does well, anybody disagree? With the virus, I mean, that's naturally occurring. Okay. It's not something that we, we did anything to. Um, but with the, I mean, they're basically doing, taking on that function of uh, manipulating genetics. So, so we mean, use natural systems to create, yeah. So don't want to get too bogged down into the details, but the point is this is a complicated topic. It's hard to come up with a single definition for what a genetically modified organism is, especially because of this concept of what's naturally occurring, in my opinion. Yeah. So polyploidy is a great source of genetic variation, and it happens naturally. Or you can do things in the laboratory to induce it. So is it, is it inherently better or worse to do something in the lab that could occur by chance in nature? It just takes 10,000 times longer to wait for it to occur in nature. Is there a difference? But when we're talking about the safety of GMOs or labeling GMOs, we're talking about should we be able to make genetically modified organisms? Does that increase in time make a difference? What do you think? Is it okay to make a genetically modified organism that would have the same mutation as one that we waited 10,000 more years for? There could be a chance that somewhere in the span between naturally to the end point that something else might have occurred that could have been beneficial to, to the organism, to whatever they're doing. So it sounds like those of you that are commenting were agreeing to disagree, <laughs> or at least we're not coming up with a consensus, which is fine. And that's, that's where the debate is currently in society. In my personal opinion, I think it's, it's fine to do something like that. There we go. There you go. So we've got one personal opinion that it's okay to genetically engineer. I think it's, I think it's okay as long as you know how to like, introduce it to society, or as long as you know how to market, um, market it. Um, and I don't think that companies like Monsanto gave it a good name uh, out the starting gate. So it's kind of created this stigma that every, like, people don't know what it is, but they know that it's not food. Mm. And so now it's... It's not, yeah, okay, so maybe this was the mistake of the, of the producers of the initial genetically modified organisms. You shouldn't call them genetically modified. You should call them something that's more palatable to the consumer. Much like, has anybody had an MRI before? A few of us, I've had quite a number of MRIs before. You know that was developed early in the 1900s and it was originally called, it wasn't magnetic resonance imaging. It was, so MRI is another word for NMR. They're, they're related. So it used to be nuclear magnetic resonance imaging. And they took the nuclear out around the middle of the 1900s because nobody wanted to be irradiated, even though that's what MRI is. But they just took the nuclear out of the name, and then, oh, everybody can have MRIs, and it's OK. Same technology, just a new name. Makes everything better. So instead of genetically modified, genetically enhanced. Genetically enhanced. Genetically augmented. Just augmented. I don't know. So let's go back. OK. Getting back to an earlier question, how would we know 
if an organism is genetically modified. Case in point. Yeah. Is this genetically modified to be square? No. You flipped ahead in the slides. Yeah, you, you can buy melon mold. Go to melonmold.com. I don't work for them. I'm not associated. Right? You grow the plant inside of acrylic cube, and it for, the fruit forms in that shape. So that's not genetically modified. But it raises an important point, one that we can certainly continue discussing. Should we have to label genetically modified foods? Should people have the choice to buy a genetically modified food? Should it be a law? Right now, it's not. There's very little regulation about what? Because, right, we did not come up with a definition for GMO, neither have lawmakers. It's like organic. You buy organic, everything is organic, everything's got carbon in it. <laughs> Chemists, right? You've taken organic chemistry, right? It's organic. It's organic. It's got carbon. When you buy organic, who knows what that means? Same with this. Yeah. Well, I, I think the discrepancy uh, surrounding surround the GMOs is not so much the labeling, but uh, to what extent are they allowed to? So you can say that, okay, I want to make a fruit that it tastes better. And then if I wanted to sell more fruit and I don't want to spend more time on that, I could uh, genetically design, let's say, a chicken who matures in a week's time. Um, how, how, I mean, and they've actually they've read that into existence um, across the farms. But you, you have a lot of questions that arise as, as to the, the ethics and the, um, the sustainability of it. If, uh. if it's maturing according to hormones that are affecting the system, um, what kind of effect is it? Producing a human who ingests that because amino acids are amino acids and they break down. But so we got concerns about ethics. So, interestingly, there are ethical arguments against making genetically modified organisms, but then there are also some ethical arguments for doing it. And we're going to check out a, an example of that in a minute. So, I want to introduce you. The goal for the rest of the class is just to introduce you to these five examples. Right, I want to just give you ideas in case you haven't heard of some of these before. This sort of explores the periphery, the boundaries of the field of genetic modification. So some people think it's unnatural to do things <coughs> like combine genes from different organisms into the same organism. We do this with plants all the time, apples, pears, grapes especially, relevant to the Central Valley, grafting. If you're going to talk about concerns, here's the real Franken plant. You've got a plant that's made up of a bunch of components of a bunch of different individuals all stitched together onto one plant. Right. Is that genetic modification? Yes or no? But it's one organism that you couldn't create without grafting. At well, least not very easily. You'd have to crossbreed and crossbreed and crossbreed to get the traits from the root stock and the traits from the fruit onto this, into the same single organism. So is this naturally occurring? No. Uh, we intervened. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So it's hard to get some varietals of grapes to grow in certain environments, so you grow, graft them onto root stock. So I'm not trying to get an answer. I'm just trying to expose you to these questions. Is it GMO or is it not? You decide. Here's the one I started with, the fruit from the tomato plant. This was produced on the left. That's traditional breeding. Natural, so to speak. Humans intervened. Yeah, we set up those crosses between those plants to create offspring that had certain characteristics. My question to you is, could that have happened in nature. Not did it, but could it? Slowly, but it could have. Those, that combination of crosses that humans set up in fields to produce the beefsteak tomato, the big one, could by chance have happened in nature. Did it? I don't know. Maybe it did somewhere and nobody saw it. So natural or not. Certain circumstances that could have fit 
favor a certain outcome other than what maybe the natural term if you never introduced a human intervention, it could have stayed like that, never had a reason. Right. So we're selecting on traits. That's the most we do when we do conventional breeding. We bring together genetic combinations that exist in nature. We just rearrange. We do the recombination of traits. Meiosis does its thing in the plants. We just take different plants that have different traits and trying to put them all together into one plant. So that's naturally existing genetic variation. That's just our hand picking who lives and who dies, which is normally something that our environment does, not something that humans do. How about this case? The Aqua Advantage Salmon. Great name. I don't know, is that either good or bad for GMO? I don't know. Here's what the engineers did, and we're going to see another example of this in the next slide or two as well, just in a, not in a fish. What, is it, what did they do? They turned up the level of a growth hormone, Jackson. But it's the salmon's own growth hormone. All they did was they looked for a mutation or they engineered a mutation. I don't know which, but does it matter? It could have been a naturally existing mutation that regulates the expression of the growth factor, or they might have induced this mutation. Right? It's not how the mutation occurs that's important. It's what it does, according to Dr. Vincelli. So this is not a transgenic organism in that it has, it's just using its own normal genes. It's just that one of its genes, a growth hormone, has increased production of the protein that's the growth hormone, so the fish grows faster. Transgenic or not? So what if they have a small little period? Or, sorry, they're... genetic modification or not? Go ahead. What if they have a small little period? Not transgenic. Well, they're likely to have like increased hormone usage. So, like humans have that teenage years where they have taken growth spurt. Yeah. Yeah. So what if they just abuse that that one trait? That's basically what's happening here. Yeah, you just keep growth hormone turned on in the fish. They grow faster. So, but they also suppress the... I don't know what it's called. Not necessarily the, the growth hormone, but the other factors that tell the body to stop. Like, kind of like uh, in human power, our arms and legs kind of tend to keep growing for a certain period. And in adulthood, if you take growth hormone, they don't get longer. They just get thicker. Because there's just that... Right. There's just that... Uh, Part of the bone that's been told by the body to stop growing. Yeah, stop growing. So presumably, I don't know if these fish keep growing and growing and growing. But this was a response, speaking of ethics, this was a response by scientists to the concern that, well, how are most salmon <coughs> that are sold at supermarkets produced? Do you know where they come from, most salmon of them? Farms. Farms. They have these big floating pens out in the ocean that are all meshed off, and you just grow these fish to, until they're adults out there in maybe poor conditions, I don't know. So this was a response to, well, let's make the process faster so that it's more environmentally friendly so we don't have these big floating tanks around there with super crowding of fish for as long. So is it better, it's just something to think about, is it better or worse to have a GMO versus a wild, natural maybe, not wild, farmed, natural genetic salmon that's living in worse conditions or takes longer to reach adulthood. Trade-offs. Right? You can't have your cake and eat it too, some of us say. Things are never, never always all good. You, get, you have trade-offs. You get some benefit. You usually have some detriment. So here's a great example for thinking about that. I'm not sure what the answer to that question is here, but I'd like you to think about it. Who really hates going to McDonald's and you get those packs of the apples in the little plastic baggie and they're kind of mushy and brown? Okay, maybe you don't go to McDonald's, that's fine. Last night I had a nice cheese board for dinner and I cut up some fruit and one of them was an apple and I cut it right before I served dinner because I didn't want my family to be eating the brown fruit because, of course, you cut the apple. What happens is you're opening up the cells. Cells release polyphenol oxidase, and that enzyme starts turning the food brown. So these fantastic scientists, no opinion, these fantastic scientists either 
you do the research and find out what they did. They either found a naturally existing mutation in an apple, or they genetically engineered this apple to change gene expression. This is gene expression regulation. They found or engineered a mutation that just turns down the amount of polyphenol oxidase that these apples make. So they make less of this enzyme. That's all they did. Could be transgenic, could be wild. I don't know. You find out. One mutation. Just reduce the amount of enzyme that gets, this one enzyme that gets made by the apple. No genes introduced by other species. And you get the apple on the bottom, the Arctic apple. Does it brown as quickly? That's it. So my, the question about the trade-off is, so you get a benefit. It's not a very important, I don't think, again, my opinion, benefit. Who cares if the apple browns faster? Consumers do. That's why growers care, right? Farmers want something they can market. And so if the consumer wants the apple not to brown, then farmers are going to feel that pressure. Maybe they'll grow this transgenic apple or genetically modified apple. What's the trade-off? You don't get a benefit without having a cost that comes with it. What do you think? I don't know if there's a right answer. I'm just curious for your feedback. Depends what that enzyme is for. I think that's the important question. If you didn't hear it in the back, it depends on what that enzyme does. We all have all of the enzymes in our body for a purpose, so what does polyphenol oxidase normally do outside of the context of a human cutting up an apple? Could be a defensive mechanism for the plant. So maybe we get non-browning. This is totally hypothetical. This is true in some organisms. I don't know if it's true in apple. You might get non-browning, but the la absence of polyphenol oxidase probably changes the flavor of the fruit. So you might get a non-browning apple that tastes shitty. Sorry, I'm recording this issue. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry, back up and re-record that. So there's always a trade-off. You don't get the benefit without usually having some sort of a cost. Not necessarily a cost that humans care about, but some sort of trade-off. Yeah, obviously, bananas, like bananas ripen, they're like a greenish, more greenish color, and then the leaves are like seven to ten days, become really, really sweet. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got, yeah, the ripening process, usually you don't, you get a certain texture with a certain flavor. Maybe you like the texture, not the flavor, but if you wait later, you get the pleasurable texture, but bad flavor, something like that. Yep. So there's always some sort of a trade-off, especially in genetically modified organisms. Does this count as genetic modification? What's this a picture of? What's it a picture of the process of, from left to right? Selective breeding. This is the domestication of corn, maize. I mean, this was done before any of the genetic modification was done. This is thousands of years old, genetic modification, if you like that definition of genetic modification. This is breeding taking existing mutants and turning them into something that's useful to eat. So thousands of years ago, and teosinthase still exists, but thousands of years ago in central or southern Mexico, people started domesticating teosinthase. They started selecting for the fruit that had certain desirable benefits. So here's a picture of an, a current teosinthase plant. It doesn't look very much like corn. It looks kind of like a corn plant. And the domestication, as I said, occurred here, southern Mexico. There was a paper published recently that showed some evidence for this. They could actually go into a cave, a shelter, where maize used to be milled or ground by hand. And they found these rock tools they could extract particles of teosinte from. And the biological material they found embedded in these rocks looks more like teosinte than modern corn. So this is how they knew that at the time, so they could date the age of these rocks. And that's how they, these scientists determined that it was literally thousands of years ago 
that this process was occurring, where they were domesticating and grinding the fruits of these plants and using them for food. So almost 10,000 years ago. So it's been a relatively long period of time since maize has been domesticated from teosinte. There's one critical difference between teosinte and maize. So this is just one publication out of many. And certainly, this is only one step in a series of steps that leads from what teosinte is to what corn today looks like. But a key change from this paper in 2004, one nucleotide mutation, single nucleotide polymorphism, one SNP, changes teosinte, which has its fruits totally enclosed by this really hard exo, I don't know what it is. I'm not a plant anatomist. Maybe somebody here is, can tell me. It's a gloom. But it's a really hard covering around the fruit. It makes it really hard for humans to get in and extract the fruit and using it, use it for food. But there was a single mutation that opened up those glooms, the fruit cups. So you can maybe see it better on the right here in panel C. Or you can start to see those fruits are a little bit exposed. They're not completely covered by the gloom. So now it's your turn. Oh my goodness, what am I trying to show you? Check it out. They've got DNA sequence from a particular gene. I'm circling in blue here on the left all of the maize plants. So what they did was they sequenced DNA from a number of different corn plants, modern corn, maize. And then in red, they got the sequence of the same genes from a bunch of different teosintate plants. So this is, a, this is a phenotypic difference, blue versus red. Red is plants that have closed fruit cups and blue open. So the question to you is, can you find a genetic difference between in the gene sequences in the top panel, the blue versus the red, that explains this difference in the phenotype, open versus closed. The way to read this, just briefly, this top line is the actual DNA sequence. Underneath it, every dot, that just means it's the same nucleotide as the sequence above it. So they just didn't want to write out the same DNA sequence time after time after time. So the only DNA nucleotides you see down here are where there are changes, mutations compared to the top line. So before I let you go to work on this for a couple minutes, what's the big difference between the maize plants and the teosinte plants? No, big picture. Don't even look at letters. What's the big difference between the top half and the bottom half? The top plants, all of the maize plants, are very genetically similar to each other. There, there are very few letters written in here. That means, for example, this bottom row, MH16, you read across, it's got exactly the same sequence as the plant on the top, except for there's one mutation there. So all of our corn plants are very genetically similar to each other. All of the teosinte plants are very genetically different. Okay. So look through this table, see if you can find one nucleotide, one site, one column left to right that controls whether or not you've got open or closed fruit cups. Go for it. Collaborate if you want. And in two minutes, I'll reveal the answer. Dun, dun, dun. Spot the mutation that causes open fruit cups.
OK, so what's the magic mutation? very last column. So if you were looking from left to right, you may still be scanning across to figure this out. That's fine. So what is it about the very right column here? And well, you have the uh, alt warning in any of the TO sente that's closed. And for some magic reason, as soon as you hit the open maze, it switches. Right. So every single plant that is a teosinte plant that has a closed fruit cup has a guanine there. And every single plant that's a teosinte, so sorry, yeah, maize has open, has a C. So every one of these is a C. That's what those dots mean. But then when we get down here to the bottom where we're looking at teosinte plants, not a single one of them has a C. They've all got Gs. So that's a perfect, as we've seen before in class, the last time we did an example like this, it was with a pedigree. But this is the idea of looking for a correlation between a genotype and a phenotype. And that's how we find mutations that affect phenotypes. There's a perfect correlation between the nucleotide. And by the way, what number is that up there at the very top? 18. This is nucleotide 18. What does that tell us? What are all of the other nucleotides up there? The numbers. What's the pattern? We've got 18 on the right. What happens as you move to the left with the numbers? They get bigger and they get, well, they don't get bigger. Negative. They get negative. So you should all know what that means. What are the negative numbers? They're upstream of the, of the transcription start site. They're in the promoter. This one. Nucleotide, the very right side, number 18, what, is the, what does it mean to us that it's a positive number? It's after the transcription start site. That is, it's the gene itself. So here it is, position 18, right there. Teosinti has a G. This is what we just saw. Maze has a C. And in this publication from 2004, John Dobley reviews that that causes a single amino acid change. One point mutation changes one amino acid in this protein from the teosinte gloom architecture gene, TGA. One mutation, one amino acid change makes that difference. Closed fruit cup, open fruit cup. Something that you can't use as food, something that you can use as food. Single mutation. I'm going to leave it to you to figure out, if you want, it's the G to C change at position 18 that changes a lysine, that's K, to asparagine, N. So the reason I put the codon table here is I'd like you to figure out what's the reading frame. Is it 16 through 18? Is it 17 through 19? Or is it 18 through 20? Fill in. some of these nucleotides to figure out how a G to C mutation could change a lysine to an asparagine. It's just for practice. But a single point mutation that happened in nature at random allowed domestication. We could do this by genetic engineering today. Single point mutation. We could do that with CRISPR, probably. We could make a transgenic plant that makes exactly the same one change in the DNA. But that would be genetic modification and presumably would have no difference. So that's the summary. We've got thousands of years of breeding versus one point mutation. That's all it took. Being a little bit glib, there were probably more mutations than that that were useful for producing other traits that are in modern corn. But that was a really important one mutation. You know, back to that table where we had um, all of the different nucleotide sequences, yeah. and maize was extremely uniform, whereas the other one had all these you know, right. differences. Yep. You know, that uniform genetics uh, of the structure, that's a detriment, isn't it? I mean, if there was that 
one disease that affected corn, there goes your supply. So this is the question of why was corn so, all of those corn plants, why were they all so genetically similar and why were the Teosinte plants so different from each other? And it's because Teosinte is wild and so there's a lot of genetic variation. But when you are a corn seed dealer and you're selling corn to farmers, you're selling the same genotype to every farmer, so it's genetically uniform regardless of whether you get, where you get the corn. And you're absolutely right. One of the detriments to doing that is that it exposes the corn potentially to, yeah, if there's one disease that that whole genotype of corn is susceptible to, then if that pest gets into California and it spreads to Oregon and to the Midwest and so forth, then everybody is SOL. I'm going to skip over the next few slides. I might come back to the next time. I might not. The story about potato. It's a really important story, but I don't have time to tell you now. What I do want to note, though, finally, before you pack up, is what to do for next class. One video. It's been on YouTube for a while. X chromosome inactivation. And two more things. Keep working on your group notes. They are going to be graded one more time. There's the date. And I'm about to send you a Google Classroom exercise for collecting your questions for the final exam review session. So here's how this works. The final exam, the final exam will be, can you go off? Okay. The final exam is going to be comprehensive, but there will be more content on the final exam, on the content we've covered since the third exam. So we will cover the entire semester's worth, but it will focus on what we've done since exam three. So what I'm asking you to do, like always, is to send me questions and an answer you think I would ask on this latest batch of information. I'll put that into a mock exam, but it's not going to be a mock final. It's just going to be mocked for this latest bit of class material. And remember, the last day of class, two weeks from today, is our final exam review session. So that the goal. These are going to be due on the third, and that's how we're going to do See you next time.